In this video, we're going to address the post-war modern movement. During both world wars, people saw new and terrifying forces that they were not prepared to deal with, like the extreme and atrocious cruelty of the Nazi genocide machine and the devastating power of the atomic bomb. Afterward, Europe really struggled to pick up the pieces after the physical and economical damage of the war. Among others, many artists fled Nazi oppression, immigrating to the United States, bringing with them their modernist ideals, which served to widen the breadth of American art to include these influences more directly. As we've seen in many movements, these artists were all challenging artistic conventions and expectations of what art should be, and they sought to overturn the traditional customs that had ruled the art world since the Renaissance. Where Depression-era artists were more focused on public issues like history, community, and social commentary, these post-war artists were far more interested in stylistic innovation and expressing more personal concerns. Many of these innovations came from New York in the decade following World War II, earning these artists and their works the title of the New York School. In the 1950s and 60s, the New York School artists were primarily leading two movements, Abstract Expressionism and Color Field, both of which were based in painting. Developing out of expressionist and surrealist pursuits, abstract expressionism sought to explore pictorial elements and formal qualities outside of storytelling and representational subject matter. A leading innovator of the movement was Jackson Pollock, who was famous for his action paintings. In the top photo that we see here, we can see Pollock's technique of applying the paint in unconventional ways like pouring, throwing, flinging, or even dripping. Where his energetic process is evident in the piece itself as part of the piece. He usually did these on large canvases to express primal human nature and raw emotions. In doing so, he made paintings that were not illusions of something else, but were paintings of paint as a material and a substance in itself. In doing this, he also innovated on the concept of painting. He collapsed pictorial space where it wasn't a window into another world, but it was instead the paint on the surface, existing in the same space as the viewer. And this is also a work where people often say, oh, I could do that, my kid could do that. And just to nip that in the bud as we continue through this time period, maybe you could, but you didn't, at least not first. And him doing that, even though it looks super easy, which it really isn't, at the time it was a major innovation in the concept and technical application of paint. Color field painting utilized large areas of color with no obvious structure, central force, or dynamic balance. Often quite large in size, they serve to engulf the viewer and command the room, giving a visceral response. Mark Rothko was a major player in color field painting, and while he had previously depicted urban settings, he moved on to more ritual and mythological themes, focusing primarily on color and superimposing thin layers on top of each other to create complex surfaces and aesthetic qualities from dense to atmospheric to luminous. He sought to elicit certain moods or feelings from viewers, like joy or serenity, or even melancholy and despair. Another major artist in this movement was Helen Frankenthaler, who expanded upon Pollock's energetic application and Rothko's fields of color, pioneering the technique of staining. To do this, she would spread the liquid colors across an unprimed canvas, coaxing the paint into fluid and organic shapes. While many of her works do have the suggestion of a landscape, that's primarily her source of inspiration for the colors and the emotions of the work, not the actual subject matter. The last color field painter we're going to talk about is Sam Gilliam. In the 1950s and 60s, he attended the Washington Color School, and he began to innovate the exhibition of painting in the mid-1960s. Where paintings had previously been stretched across stretchers, usually in a rectangular format, Gilliam instead pursued his drape paintings, in which he liberated the painting itself from the frame and installed it in unique orientations hung across surfaces of the gallery. In the top image, we see a drape painting hung by knots on a wall. Some of his other pieces are suspended between two walls or even from the ceiling. This bottom image is an example of his merging of sculpture with painting. During the 1940s and 50s, Artists were avoiding recognizable subject matter, but moving into the mid-50s, some artists began to see the value in doing this still, while also referencing the materiality of the urban setting around them, 
and assemblages aimed to do just that. They took Dada collage into the third dimension through loose conglomerations of seemingly random found objects. Robert Rauschenberg was one artist that utilized assemblage. In his work, he combined the brushwork of the abstract expressionist with ordinary objects and collage materials to create what he called combines or combine paintings because, as their name suggests, they combined sculpture with painting. So far as the objects that he chose, he emphasized the environment surrounding him and used materials that would address the disorder of urban civilization. Another assemblage artist was Jasper Johns, and he tried to create deceptively simple work that had a very graphic nature. His larger early paintings were often using forms like targets, maps, flags, and numbers. In utilizing these sorts of symbols, he was trying to find the differentiation between graphics as emblems of meaning as opposed to individualized works of art. And his combination of these signages with painting would go on to have a major influence on the later pop art movement. During the 1965 L.A. Watts riots, which were a response to racialized police brutality, black artists started to directly address their feelings and experiences surrounding the topic. One such artist was Noah Purifoy, who collected debris from a building burnout in the riots to use in his own assemblages. Doing this adds so much context, history, and a sense of place to the work that any other piece of burnt wood, perhaps chosen solely for its aesthetic, obviously would lack entirely. The work that we see here is a result of this collection, and it sought to memorialize the uprising as part of his cultural and personal history without glorifying it. Pop art was born from advertising, consumerism, and mass media culture. Intrigued by its cultural effects and conventions, going so far as to mimic its processes or to totally transplant ready-mades into the work itself, to challenge expectations and assumptions about art at the time. Inspired by design and commercial art, pop artists often use screen printing and airbrush techniques to participate in mass production themselves while giving their art the same aesthetic. One of the first pop artists was Richard Hamilton, who created this collage here using the visual conventions from advertising layouts, name brand packaging, comic strips, as well as other visual cliches found on billboards, newspapers, movie theaters, TVs, and more. Moving on to the most visible, popular, yet controversial pop artist, we have Andy Warhol. He was a commercial artist before moving into fine art to address the effects of mass media and marketing on the American public, such as celebrity culture, wherein famous people became mere icons reproduced throughout media just to sell something. Like in the top image that we see here, when we see Marilyn Monroe's face so many times, are we brought to the concept of Marilyn Monroe as a person? Or is she reduced to the icon we've seen reproduced so many times, packaged as a commodity in itself? Warhol's work also pointed out how the American cultural landscape was being forged by these pervasive and insistent commercial environments and mass imagery flowing throughout it. Another very famous pop artist is Roy Lichtenstein. He played on familiar images like paintings from our history or common comic book images, altering them to enhance their drama or to appear with a more commercial context. He did this by using visual elements like bright primary colors, impersonal surfaces, and printing dots. Once he decided on his imagery and how to depict it, he would paint the work using stencils and the colored dot pattern of contemporary mass printing called the Bende Dot. His work was a commentary on consumer goods and the demand for a dramatic spectacle. The artist described pop art as the involvement with what I think to be the most brazen and threatening characteristics of our culture, things we hate, but things which are also powerful in their impingement upon us. During the 1950s and 60s, some artists tried to totally exclude subject matter, symbolic meaning, personal content, and hidden messages from their work focusing instead on only the formal qualities of the pieces, like color and shape. In addition, artists like Donald Judd elected not to title their works at all, so as to avoid any unwanted ideological projections onto the piece. Another famous minimalist was painter Frank Stella, who sought to emphasize the flatness of the picture plane, emphasizing its boundaries, and even shaping his canvases to fit his forms, because a rectangular work of art may still be connected with being a picture of something. Heavily influenced by the first champion of art as idea, Marcel Duchamp, 
conceptual art developed to push back on the outgrowth of minimalism. It was also related to the prevalence of consumerism as fueled by mass media, both using it within their works through found objects and ready-mades, while also challenging it as something mass-produced for consumers more so than for thought. In doing this, conceptual art was a direct response to the oversaturation of marketing and advertising imagery in cultural mass media as well as appropriated in pop art. Site-specific works are basically what they sound like. They were designed to be displayed in a specific place, making them a bit immovable, sometimes temporary, and for the most part outside of the gallery. Christo was a major leader for the site-specific movement. And collaborating with his wife, Jean-Claude, he created the running fence that we see here. This site-specific installation was 18 feet high and 24 and a half miles long. Made up of a white nylon fence, it stretched throughout agricultural and dairy land in California. The work was transient or non-permanent. Basically, it was temporary. As a result, it was very process-oriented and the result couldn't be bought or relocated. It had to be experienced. Some people say transient, others say ephemeral, but both terms refer to something non-permanent and in the moment. Christo talks about his work being more so about the process to create it rather than the work itself. For the running fence, he had to go to multiple public hearings and get the agreement of various landowners, in addition to the labor of hundreds of workers just to construct it, all of which is part of the artwork. While minimal and conceptual art were radical in their own right and in their own way, they still relied on the gallery system to interact with the public. So earthworks were an expansion beyond this. They were environmental sculptures created of environmental materials, like earth, rocks, and sometimes plants. Robert Smithson was one of the founders of the earthworks movement, and he created the image that we see here. And he did this by hauling several thousand tons of basalt rock out to the Great Salt Lake in Utah, and he arranged it in such a way that it created a 1,500-foot-long spiral, creating, as the name suggests, an earth work. It's made out of earth into the earth. Impactful in their own right because of their beauty and size, earthworks also rely on the juxtaposition between willful human design and the natural surroundings and organic elements. Next, we have installation, which is a work of art that's not portable. It has to literally be installed into wherever it's going to be shown. As a result, it's meant to immerse the viewer into the work without just being hung on the wall or even limited to the gallery at all. Which means that installation is definitely not always site-specific, but it can be. Yayoi Kusama is a really famous installation artist. She combines the all-over compositions of abstract expressionism with her urge to create dots and a sense of the infinite. Both of these visual tools reference the viewer's own smallness, as if felt in the crowd of other people, or perhaps in the universe as a whole. In addition to her dots, she's also well known for her infinity mirrors, which we can see here. Female artists also started to speak out about their own struggles with prejudice. And as artists, this presented primarily as lack of opportunity, not being taken seriously, and being exhibited much less than their male counterparts. Their work often dealt with conversations about the political and cultural treatment and control over their bodies. As a result, many female artists turned to performance because it really made the most sense with what they were talking about. However, one work that was not performance is Judy Chicago's The Dinner Party, which we can see here. It was a monumental collaborative sculpture with 39 elaborate place settings, and it literally gives historical and mythological women a seat at this table while also dealing with the representation, or rather lack thereof, of women in art or in positions of power. It was controversial because of its depictions of vaginal plates, but in doing this, the artist sought to defy the notion that women's bodies were obscene, invalid, or shameful, and sought to reclaim the vaginal form. East Coast feminists were seen as a bit more pointed with their protests, and they went on to form the group Women Artists in Revolution. It was a group that picketed museums and private dealers who were reluctant to show art made by women. And they also founded their own collaborative gallery, Artists in Residence. Nancy Spiro was part of both Women Artists in Revolution and the Artists in Residence. The work that we see here is a female sprinter running out of a Venus statue. 
which has primarily shown women as objects of either love or desire. But the sprinter runs through this idea, demanding her own agency in the foreground. Orlan was another early feminist artist, who was working primarily in performance centered around the female body and its cultural context of debate and struggle. In 1974, she performed a striptease while wearing a religious costume based on Bernini's Ecstasy of St. Teresa, and later she crashed a contemporary art exhibit that she was not invited to, but set up her performance installation anyway. And she set this up at the stairway leading up to the exhibit. During her performance, viewers could either offer a candle to the artist as a saint, dressed in the same costuming as before, or offer a coin to Orlan the body, represented by a constructed vending machine, in exchange for a kiss from the artist. So what? Why does any of this matter? Well, as usual, art is going to reflect the times, so we're learning a lot about history. But this time period is also setting up a lot of what we see in contemporary art today. Formally speaking, contemporary art doesn't really have any rules, and that's because this time period decided to break and rewrite all of them. You didn't have to be confined to 2D or 3D. You could combine painting and sculpture. You could create work that had no subject or story or anything. It could just be a shape or just a material. Art was taken off the gallery walls and suspended in air, or it was taken out of the gallery altogether and into nature. And we also see the use of objects that have a previous life. Duchamp's urinal was just a urinal. It was meant to reflect on the mass production of an object and how we define what is and is not art. But Noah Purifoy took this a step further. He didn't want something that was machine made or mass produced. He wanted something with a history of a certain event and location. So we're really seeing how all of these art movements have built us forward into the works that we see now. And that's where I'm going to end this lecture. As usual, stay safe, get enough sleep, and I'll see you all in class.